week. So chapter 16, the whole chapter is on the statement of cash flows. <clears throat> and the statement of cash flows tracks the inflows and outflows of cash. So every way that a company received cash and every way that they spent cash. So let's, let's think about the different ways that cash can be treated if you're a business or if you're a person. So say that I give, I just come up and I give Kevin a hundred dollar bill. All right, how would Kevin treat that? If he were keeping a personal financial statement? It'd be a gift, right? So he didn't do anything to earn it. He didn't perform any services. He didn't sell me anything. I just walk up to him and I give him a hundred dollar bill. So he would treat that as a gift. What if um, I hired Kevin to do something? And he came and he performed a service, uh, and then I paid him $100. He would record that as revenue, right? So he's, he's gone and he's performed a service. The same $100 is treated differently. It's treated as revenue. If, um, if he sells me something and I pay him $100 for some piece of merchandise, then he's made $100 in revenue, but associated with that $100, would be some cost to him of providing me that good. So he'd either have a cost of merchandise sold, or if he actually built this item, then he would have to add up the cost of raw materials and things like that. All right, so there's another, another way that we can treat it. If um, also, if he sold me an item, so say he sold me his old iPhone or something like that, um, he would have an asset that he would have to get rid of as well. So he would get $100 for selling me an item, but then he would have to get rid of an asset that he had. So he'd be trading cash for an asset. So another way that we could do it is I could loan Kevin $100. So I could say, hey, here's 100 bucks. I'll loan it to you, but I expect you to pay me back $100 plus interest in three months, six months, something like that. So now that $100 to him, while it is an asset, it's got a liability attached to it. So he owes me $100 plus some form of interest. Um, so the same amount of cash can be represented a number of different ways when we think about um, the story behind it or kind of what is the, what's the framework that that cash is uh, set in, okay? So that's kind of the, the mindset that we have to have when we look at a statement of cash flows is we're trying to show how did the company spend their cash and then we're gonna have three buckets that that cash will sit in. So depending how it was spent, that's where that money's gonna sit in the statement of cash flows, all right? So statement of cash flows reports a company's inflows and outflows of cash. It provides useful information about a company's ability to do the following. So. <clears throat> Is your company making money? If it's not making money, the likelihood of you continuing to run that business is small. All right, so the statement of cash flows will tell us, are you generating cash from your business? If you wanted to expand, could you do that? So if you wanna expand, you're gonna to have to have capital, you're gonna to have to have money to be able to fund that expansion. Also, can you pay your bill? So if you have a lot of debt, if you have all of these accounts payable, these liabilities that are lined up, yet you don't have the cash to pay them, your, your business cannot flourish, okay? So can you meet your financial obligations? And then lastly, can you pay dividends if you choose to? So a dividend is, um, I believe it's in a later chapter, but the um, main place the dividend shows is in a stock price. All right, so take a... Certain stocks offer stockholders a dividend, which is an incentive to hold that stock. All right, so when I worked at Windstream Communications, this was back in 2011 to 2013. So Windstream stock price was roughly $8 a share. Okay, and associated with that stock was a $1 dividend. So that meant if you held a Windstream share for a full year, you would end up getting a dollar dividend for holding that share. All right, so an $8 stock price with a $1 dividend, that's a pretty good deal, especially if you had 
however many shares you had, 100 shares, a million shares, um, just depending however much you want to invest. So that was a big draw for a windstream stock, and that um, was definitely a benefit of holding that stock, is you knew you could always count on that $1 dividend, so a 25 cents each quarter, um, associated with that stock. Now, if a business isn't doing well, they might not be able to pay a dividend. So a few years ago, well after I moved from Little Rock, uh, Windstream, I believe, chose to not pay their dividend. And as soon as they did that, their stock price, it took a downfall. Okay, That wasn't the only thing associated with it, but um, if they didn't have that dividend, there wasn't a lot of reason for people to invest in it. So, so the statement of cash flows can kind of tell us, are we going to be able to do all of these things? It's used by both managers, so internally, <clears throat> to see how's our business growing, how are we doing compared to past quarters, past years. Uh, it's also used by external users, so investors, obviously, and creditors, to see kind of what does the future look like and how's the company going to be able to grow or flourish uh, where it currently is. Okay. So what's the statement of cash flows look like? So there's three sections that cash can sit into. So whenever I was studying for the CPA exam, they used to have all of these. Um, I'm going blank. What's the abbreviations? The word like? Tickers. So OIF stood for Operating Investing Financing. What is that? I'm drawing a blank. Anyway, I'll think of it. So anyway, there's three sections, and they go in order. There's Operating Activities first, Investing Activities second, Financing and Activities last. So to remember it is OIF, and the, the order is very important, okay? So Operating Activities are your daily activities for the company. So daily operating activities that have to fund the business of the company, all right? Investing activities, it's a specific subset that only deals with investments. So investments would be assets that you're not currently using in the business. So if you are, say that you bought a vehicle to try and flip it, then that's not an asset that you're using in the daily course of your business. So you're treating that asset as an investment. Um, those type things, the purchase and sale of fixed assets, such as equipment and buildings. So those are considered investing activities. Financing activities <coughs> deal with equity or debt. So it's a specific subset of the business. Operating activities is everything else. Okay. So purchase and sale of merchandise by a retailer, um, salaries, everything else is jumbled up into operating activities. So operating activities is the biggest section on the statement of cash flows. So how does the statement of cash flows look? Here we go. So statement of cash flows is set up the same way as an income statement and a statement of owner's equity. Now, what do I mean by that? So if you look at the income statement, remember an income statement is, is based on a period of time. Normally it's a year. So when you look at the income statement, it says the income statement for the year ended December 31st, whatever year that we're in right now. When you look at statement of owner's equity or retained earnings, it's the same way. For the year ended December 31st, whatever year. So you look at owner's equity over the period of time. Now, when you look at the balance sheet, and we've talked about this, the balance sheet is only a snapshot. So it's based on a specific time period or a specific time. So when you look at the balance sheet, it says as of December 31st. So you wouldn't look at cash and how it's changed over the year. When you're talking about the balance sheet, you would say, how much cash do we have on December 31st? What was our accounts receivable balance as of December 31st? Okay. 
But when we talk about the statement of cash flows, we're looking at how did cash flow over this period of time. So once again, we would say for the year ended, December 31st, and whatever, whatever year we're in. All right, so it's broken down into three categories. Cash flows from or used for operating activities, used, uh, cash flows from or used for investing activities, cash flows from or used for financing activities. And so you take all three of those sections and you come up with either a net increase or a net decrease in cash. And then we take that net increase and that net decrease, or that net decrease, and we add it to what was the beginning cash balance. And that should give us our ending cash balance. So if you think about it in a T account form, so you have cash. On January 1st, we're going to have about a cash balance, okay? On December 31st, we're going to have our cash balance. We already know what that balance is from the balance sheet, okay? So what we're trying to figure out is how do we summarize total inflows of cash and total outflows of cash? And that's what the statement of cash flows attempts to do. All right, so... This is the net increase or decrease in cash. And if you take that and add it to the beginning balance, naturally we should end up with the ending balance, right? All right. So, does anyone know? So there's an order that the financial statements have to be prepared in. And the statement of cash flows is last. Do you guys remember why it's last? Or do you guys remember which one is first? Income statements first. Correct. So why is it first? So the income statement is made up of all revenues and all expenses. So you take revenue minus expense, and that will give us either net income or a net loss, depending on if revenues or expenses greater. Okay, the reason that's first is we have to know what net income is to be able to correctly state what our ending owner's equity is. All right, so the second statement, the statement of owner's equity. The statement of owner's equity takes beginning balance of owner's equity, and then we add to that anything that would increase our owner's equity. So if we contributed cash to the business, or net income, and then we take away things that would decrease our owner's equity, and the only thing that we've discussed so far is drawing. So if an owner decides to take money out of the business for uh, personal reasons, that would decrease their amount of ownership interest. So the statement of owner's equity, what we end up with is ending owner's equity, okay? Ending owner's equity flows directly into the balance sheet. And you know, the balance sheet mirrors the accounting equation. So you have all assets, then you have all liabilities, and then we have owner's equity. And assets equals liabilities plus owner's equity. So ending owner's equity comes straight from the statement of owner's equity. So lastly, is a statement of cash flows. And, you know, in this group of assets, is gonna be cash. So ending cash is gonna show up on the statement of cash flows. So that's why there is a particular order to the four financial statements. Um, and that's why a statement of cash flows is last. All right, so let's look at a little bit about operating activities. So we are, so you know, we only have one class that so we're gonna discuss this. So normally we would work through how to create a statement of cash flows. And we would look at everything that goes into deciding cash flows from or used for operating activities and the other two sections as well. 
Uh, we're not going to be able to do that today. So the main things that you're going to be tested on for chapter 16 is um, the layout of a statement of cash flows. So what are the different types of activities that show up? What is the order that they appear in? And then um, things like that. So we're only going to look at objective 16-1A and then the introduction to 16-1. So there's only two pieces of chapter 16 that I expect you guys to be able to review, and that's what we're going to be tested on, okay? All right, so when we talk about cash flows from or used for operating activities, did anybody read chapter 16? You said nope. Respect to honesty. Um, so what does it mean by cash flows from and then in parentheses used for? So there's two possible outcomes to operating activities. Either we had an inflow of cash from operating activities or we had an outflow of cash from operating activities. If we had an inflow, an overall net inflow, then that would be cash flows from operating activities. But if we had a net outflow, meaning that we spent more than we brought in from these operating activities, then that would be cash flows used for operating activities. So depending on if we had a net inflow or outflow, that's where these two phrases come. So you'd only use one on the actual cash flow statement, okay? So cash, flow, cash flows from operating activities report inflows and outflows from the day-to-day -day operations. And there's two different methods that a company can use to report cash flows from operating activities. The direct method and indirect. Now, we would normally spend a lot of time going over these, but I'm gonna give you the high-level view of both of these methods. So each method is gonna give you the same answer. So if you use the direct method, you're gonna end up with net cash flows from or used for operating activities. <clears throat> if you use the indirect method, you're gonna end up with net cash flows from or used for operating activities. So both methods, they end up with the same answer. It's just they use different ways of coming up with that answer. Most companies use the indirect method. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why. So when you talk about the direct method, so the way the direct method calculates net cash flows from or used for operating activities is by looking at cash received from customers, cash paid for merchandise, cash paid for operating expenses, cash paid for interest, and cash paid for income tax. Can you guys think of any issue that we might run into when we try to calculate those things. So let's take cash received from customers. So cash received from customers. How many different ways have we said that it's possible to make a sale? We can have a cash sale, but what's another way that we can make a sale? Credit. On credit, right? So how would we treat cash received from customers when we allow credit sales? And the question is, it's a little difficult. So each of these methods, so to figure out cash received from customers, you have to look at the change in accounts receivable, and you also have to look at cash. So while this is the direct method, says it's a direct method. And it's a direct method because you're directly solving for cash received from customers. Um, the formulas to be able to solve for these things are a little difficult. And all of this information is not readily available to companies. <clears throat> so for you to be able to calculate cash received from customers, you're gonna have to go and pull additional information. Same for cash paid for merchandise. Same for cash paid for operating expenses. So it's called the direct method, 
but none of these calculations are very direct. So as a result of that, most companies shy away from using the direct method because it's additional work. And you know, if you're in business, you want the easiest, most accessible, uh, most readily available information that you can use. And it's also less costly to use the indirect method. So that's why most companies choose to use the indirect method. So when you look in this second paragraph, the primary advantage of the direct method is that it directly reports cash receipts and cash payments, but the primary disadvantage is that that data is not readily available. So it's more costly to prepare, and as a result, it's not used as often. So let's compare that to the indirect method. All right, so the indirect method, as I said, most companies use this method. The reason it's called the indirect method is we are indirectly solving for uh, net cash flows from or used in operating activities. And the way that, net, that the indirect method works, we always start with net income, okay? Do you guys remember how we get net income? So net income is found on the income statement. And the income statement is made up of revenues and expenses. So total revenue minus total expense gives us net income. So we start with net income and then we back out non-cash transactions that have affected net income. So <clears throat> what I mean by that, think about some of the types of journal entries that impact the income statement. All right, namely depreciation. So in chapter three, we talked about adjusting entries. One of the adjusting entries was to record depreciation. Somebody remind me what depreciation is. Say it again. Yeah, so you take a new vehicle. We buy a new vehicle, six months later, that vehicle is not worth what we paid for. But we can't go and decrease the value of that vehicle in its specific account because of the cost concept. We need to know what we paid for that vehicle, so we can't impact that specific account. So what we did as a result is we created a contra asset called accumulated depreciation. And accumulated depreciation, it was a contra asset. It has a normal credit balance. And so that account is where we record all of the declines in value for our assets. All right, so the, the adjusting entry for uh, depreciation was a, a debit to depreciation expense and a credit to accumulated depreciation. You guys remember that? Okay. Would this journal entry impact the income statement? So depreciation expense shows up in the, in the income statement. So does this journal entry impact net income? Yes. Is cash involved in this transaction? So when you, record, when you record the decline of value on a vehicle or a piece of machinery or a building, does, do you lose any cash? No. But we are impacting net income. So if we're trying to figure out what is net cash flow from operating activities, we can start with net income as a starting place but there are journal entries like this that falsely bring down net income. So you have to add back those non-cash expenses, and then we do a couple of other things, and indirectly we get back to net cash flows from operating activities, okay? And normally we would walk through all of those, but I just want you guys to have a, a base knowledge of, of these two methods 
So the main draw or the primary advantage to the indirect method <clears throat> is that it's not costly. All of this information is very readily available. So uh, net income is obviously available. We've already performed an income statement. Um, all of the non-cash transactions, we would have those. And then it also takes into account the change in current assets from one year to the next. And we would also already have those. So all of that information is, is readily available. So it's easy to compile the indirect method for the uh, operating activities. So it's less costly to prepare and that's why most companies choose it, okay? And that's really all, that's all I wanna cover on chapter 16. So now I want to look at the test prep questions that I put out, walk through those with you guys and make sure that if you have any questions, I wanna, I wanna give you a chance to ask me. All right, so if you wanna pull up the test prep number three, it's in the test three review. So this has 10 questions. Only five of them are gonna be relevant to us because the number six through 10 deal with chapter 16. And I'm not, I'm not gonna test you guys on actual problems trying to solve for uh, net cash flow from operating activities. Those really don't apply. But the way that I would treat this and I also put another section of questions out uh, I would work through these first five questions and come up with your answers. Understand why you have one answer over another. And then once you finish that, the answers are at the very bottom. But if you go and you look at the answer as you're solving it, it does you no good. And it doesn't help. So... All right, so let's look at number one. So number one says dollar company, I think it's bigger. Dollar company sold merchandise to pound company on account for 25,500 bucks. Terms 215, net 45. Pound company paid the invoice within the discount period. What is the amount of sales from the above transactions? All right, this same question. I could have this same question four or five different times and each time I ask you something different. So whenever you go and you read a question on a test, the first thing we have to do is we have to figure out what is being asked of us and then go solve for that because we don't want to spend our time solving something else that's not relevant to uh, the question that we're being asked. All right, so dollar company is the seller, pound company is the buyer. And we're being asked what is the amount of sales from the above transactions. All right, so gross sales would be 25, 5,500. So obviously that's gonna be an answer choice, but that's incorrect. Why is 25, five incorrect? Because we haven't had the discount yet. Yeah, so we're trying to entice this company to pay early, to pay within the first 15 days. And the way that we do that is we're offering them a 2% discount. Okay, so if they pay within the first 15 days, we're gonna knock 2% off the amount that they owe. So if we multiply 25.5 by 2%, it comes out to, yeah, 510 bucks. And then if you say 25.5 minus 510, you get 24,990. Okay, so C is the obvious right answer. Now let's say that for whatever reason you, you couldn't think of that. 
All right, you could back into that answer by thinking, all right, if they, if, if they charge us $25,500 for this sale, why would we pay $26,010? You would not. So that's an obvious wrong answer. And then if they're charging us $25,500, why would they be knocking off roughly 40%? Okay, so the 16,000 is obviously a wrong answer too. So you could have backed into 24,990 if you couldn't remember about the discount. So C is the right answer there. Okay? Any questions? Tanner, are you good? Yep. All right, number two. So number two says... A sales invoice included the following merchandise price. $12,000 in sales. We have a 1% discount if it's paid within 10 days. Uh, if it's not paid within 10 days, the net amount is due by the end of the month. Uh, FOB shipping point with prepaid freight of $900 added to the invoice. Assuming that a credit for merchandise return of $500 is granted prior to payment and the invoice is paid within the discount period. What is the amount of cash that should be received by the seller? All right, a lot going on here. A lot of information. So if I were working this problem, you want to take everything one step at a time. So we say, what is the, what is the amount that we bought? We bought $12,000 worth of goods. Did we end up returning anything? Yeah. So it says, assume that a credit of... $500 was issued because we returned that amount of merchandise. All right. Normally, you could net those two together and say, hey, I actually bought $11,500. They want us to treat them separately because um, if the $500 was returned after payment, then it's going to be treated differently. So they want us to break it out and treat each one separately. So if we bought $12,000 worth of goods and we received a 1% discount, that would be $120 off. Okay, and then we also have to multiply the 1% by what we returned. So 11880 minus... what you have to subtract what well, you give me the answer already all right so 11880 minus 495 is 11385 so 11385 is what we actually paid for just the merchandise okay now, potentially we're through with this problem, but we also have to think about freight. So were we responsible for freight while it was being in transit or was the seller responsible? Depending on who was responsible, if we were responsible as the buyer for this merchandise while it was being shipped, then we can add the cost of freight to our overall co cost for merchandise. All right, so let's go look at freight. So it says FOB shipping point. So under FOB shipping point, when does ownership change hands from the seller to the buyer? The buyer gets it. So that's destination. So FOB shipping point, ownership transfers at the shipping point. So whenever the seller goes to FedEx or UPS or USPS and they drop it off to be shipped, at that point, ownership transfers to the buyer. So if the buyer has ownership of these goods while they're in transit, then they can add the cost of freight to the overall cost of merchandise because they were responsible for it while it was being shipped. So we paid $11,385 for the goods, but then we're also able to add the $900 for freight to the cost of our merchandise. So the amount of cash that would be received by the seller 
It's 12, 385, 12, 285. Sorry. And the amount of merchandise inventory that the buyer would record on their books is also 12, 285. Okay. Do you guys see why that is? All right. Now, if this problem had said, a sales invoice included the following merchandise, and it said FOB destination, this answer would still be the same because it's asking us what is the amount of cash that would be received by the seller. All right. So we know that freight was added to the invoice. Now, if instead, let's see if I can do this. Hmm. See if I can open up a new Word document. So if instead of asking what is the amount of cash that should be received, if instead I said, what is the amount of merchandise inventory that would be recorded by the seller? Then the way that it's presently worded, it would be 12,285. But if it were FOB destination, it would be 11,385. Because if it's FOB destination, ownership doesn't transfer until the goods are delivered. And if the buyer is not maintaining ownership during transit, they can't add that $900 for freight to the cost of merchandise. Does that, do you guys understand what I'm saying? I don't want to confuse you. So the way that the question is worded, the answer is 12285, and it's based on how we just worked it. So if instead it had said this, sales invoice included the following information, merchandise price 12,000, terms for the discount was 1% within 10 days, uh, FOB destination with prepaid freight of 900 bucks added to the invoice, and then assuming that the credit was granted prior to payment and invoice is paid within the discount period, what is the amount of merchandise inventory that should be recorded by the seller? If that were the question that you were asked, the answer would be 11385 And the reason is the buyer cannot add freight to the cost of merchandise because they weren't responsible for it while it was in transit. Okay, so, you know, before we looked at these, I said make sure that you look at all the details and then make sure you look at what's being asked. Have I confused you? Hopefully not. All right. Let's go look at number three. All right. Number three. Number three says, Emma Company sold to Isabella Company merchandise on account using FOB shipping point with a 2% discount within 10 days for $15,000. Emma Company paid the $750 shipping charge using the perpetual inventory system which of the following entries will Isabella Company make to record the payment for merchandise if they pay within the discount period? All right. So, once again, a lot of information. And I always like to make sure that I have it lined up before I start trying to work it. So, Emma Company is the seller. Isabella Company is the buyer. So Isabella Company bought merchandise on account for FOB shipping points. So this is who we're 
who we're worried about. We're worried about the buyer. We're looking at it from the buyer's point of view. Okay? So they bought goods for $15,000. And the seller prepaid shipping. All right? So we know that we got a 2% discount. So they knocked 300 bucks off. So fourteen seven hundred is what um, we paid for the actual merchandise. All right, but what were the shipping terms? The shipping terms were FOB shipping points. That means at the moment the seller dropped the goods off at the distributor, USPS, UPS, FedEx, after they dropped them off at the shipping point, the ownership transferred to the buyer. So because Emma Company, or sorry, because Isabella Company, the buyer, was responsible for these goods during transit, we can add that freight cost to the overall cost of the merchandise that we would purchase. Okay? So, what is the initial transaction that we would make as the buyer for these goods? So we would debit merchandise inventory for fifteen five forty, and we would credit accounts payable for fifteen four fifty. You guys agree with that? All right. But so that's not what this question is asking. This is saying which of the following entries will Isabella Company make to record the payment for the merchandise? if they pay within the discount period. So, this was the first transaction. This is on the date of sale. The transaction they're asking us about happens within the next 10 days. So how would we pay off this liability that we have? We would debit accounts payable for 15, 450, and then we would pay them in cash. So we would credit cash for 15450 So we go and we look for the correct answer. So A is incorrect. Oops. A is incorrect. And the reason A is incorrect is it did not take into account the discount or the amount of freight. B, potentially the correct answer. So we'll come back to it. Um, the reason C is incorrect C does not take into account the discount, and they debit freight in, which we have not talked about that. So that should be an automatic trigger that it's the wrong answer. <clears throat> and then D, D also does not take into account the discount, um, so it's automatically wrong. So that's why B is the correct answer. Does everybody see? So if I gave you this exact question on the test, but with different answers. Can you guys see where I got it? Can you get there yourself, possibly? Hopefully so. All right, let's look at number four. Number four says, if merchandise sells for 3,500 bucks, with terms 3% discount within 15 days, and the cost of the inventory sold is 2,100. The amount charged to sales is blank. So what would, what was what's the first thing you would do? So first of all, you would you would need to know what the flow of, of sales is. So if you're the seller, you know every time you make a sale, you make two journal entries. The first is either a debit to cash or a debit to accounts receivable and a credit to sales. And the second is a debit to cost of merchandise sold for the cost of the inventory. And then we have to get rid of the inventory that we just sold. So a credit to merchandise inventory. This question is asking about that first journal entry. All right, so the way that you would solve this is you would say, hey, if gross sales was 3,500, but we offered a 3% discount, then what is the amount that we're going to charge to sales? And it's going to be 
up to 3,500. So say that you don't know how to calculate. If you made a sale for 3,500, you would not record 2,037 bucks to um, sales. You would not record $2,100 because $2,100 is the cost of the inventory that you sold. It's not what you sold it for. And then because you offered the, the customer a discount, you wouldn't charge full price. So you could automatically see that A is the correct answer because B, C, and D are all. You guys see why that is, everybody? Okay. Let's look at number five. All right. Five says journalize the following transaction. So you sold merchandise on account, 17,300 bucks, with a 2% discount, and the cost of the merchandise sold was 12,600. It's a very, this is one of the standard problems. Um, I would hope everyone in here can do this pretty easily. So, we just, I just had both transactions that we would perform written up here. These don't change if you're the seller, all right? So, now the only thing that we have to figure out is what are the numbers that go in here? So if we sold merchandise for 17.3, but then we offered a 2% discount, we need to figure out what is the cost of that discount. So you'd say 17.3, times 98% is 16,954. So $16,954 represents the amount of our sale. And we know that it was on account. So we're gonna debit accounts receivable for 16,954. And then what do we put for cost of merchandise sold? Does the discount get applied to cost of merchandise sold? Yeah. No, because the cost is what it was. We don't, we already know what we paid for the merchandise that we're now selling. So the cost of merchandise sold stays at 12.6. All right, so what if, <clears throat> what if instead I asked you, what is the gross profit on the sale? Could you solve for that? Or do you need more information? Anybody? So the way that we calculate gross profit So that was on the first page of chapter six. So sales minus gross profit, or sorry, sales minus cost of merchandise sold gives us gross profit. So we have both of those numbers. So our sale was for 16,954. And the cost of that merchandise to us was 12,600. So our gross profit on that merchandise should be $4,354. You guys agree? All right. Anybody have any questions about chapter six, about chapter 16, um, anything? So our test is next Thursday. So if you look, we have homework that's due tomorrow. If you go and you look at your homework, I think you have to watch like a three or four minute video and then answer a few questions. So after tomorrow, we are, or after, I guess after today, we're not covering anything new the rest of the semester. So if you have homework uh, assignments that you guys have not completed, yesterday would have been the day to do them, but you don't, you don't wanna have assignments that you did not complete. 
You're only hurting your grade. Okay. So you go in here, you watch this video, and then it has three questions. So it should take you two minutes to do. Um, so our test is next Thursday. We will use our iPads or your computer. Um, but we'll take it in here. And then two weeks from now, we'll have our final exam. And our final, I believe, let me look at that real quick. So the way we're doing our final, I think ours starts at 1.30. So you guys will come in at 3. So group A will come in at 1.30. And you guys will come in at 3. But I'll, I'll remind you of that next week. Um, so any questions? All right. Let me take a roll real quick. Here, Caleb's here. Jared's here. Chris is here. Uh, Charlie's here. 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 Charl